Good morning and welcome to On the Record with Buddy Cianci. This coming Tuesday, the Rhode Island State House of Representatives and the State Senate will convene and they'll have their normal pomp and circumstance and say nice things about each other, welcome new members, etc. or maybe just say hello to old members. They'll assign committees, etc. and the games will begin again. Well, my guest this morning is the Republican Minority Leader. Uh, they have about, in between the Senate and the House, I think they have like 11 members, which are, come, it's not even 10% of the legislature, but they can be vocal, and they also can be uh, substantive in many ways. So I wanted to have him on today to tell us what the agenda that the Republicans have. And you're gonna find out this year, there's a lot of issues where the Republican Party could make a difference. 38 studios, whether we should pay them or not. Pension reform is another one. Uh, and so many other issues, the structural deficit. So we're gonna hear from Brian Newberg. He's in his third term. He represents Boroughville and North Smithfield. Uh, he's a uh, practicing attorney and uh, is a, uh, a, a guide in the world Republican. So we're going to hear what they have to say. Not that they're in the majority, but they do have a voice. Brian Newberry, welcome to On the Record with Buddy Sancy. Thanks for being with us at the start of this legislative session. Oh, good morning, Buddy. Nice to see you. Thank you. Tell me, um, what are the biggest issues that you see confronting the legislature or the state of Rhode Island this coming session? There's so many I could point out, but let's hear it from you. Well, it's a funny question because there's issues that we're going to confront and issues that we should confront. They're not necessarily the same thing. <laughs> okay. Um, issues you should have confronted last year, but didn't. Well, the, the biggest issue facing the state is the economy. Right. And that's not new. That's been that way Forever. during my five years in the legislature. Okay. And what we should be doing is looking for ways to make Rhode Island more competitive, to attract business, to encourage business that's here, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, I don't see a lot of that happening, but as you said, there is a Republican agenda. We'll be rolling it out over the next couple of months. Can you tell um, us what, what the Republican agenda will touch on? I mean, I don't want you to let all the cats out of the bag. Yeah, well, let me put it this way. I don't believe in silver bullets. You know, 38 Studios, which I, I know we're going to talk yeah. about, was an attempt at a silver bullet. Silver bullets are not going to fix the economy. We need mm -hmm. to make the entire state's climate, business climate, more attractive. No one piece of legislation is going to do that. It's going to take, you know, the Senate last year used the term moving the needle. Mm -hmm. I wasn't impressed with the substance of what they put out, but I did like the concept. Mm -hmm. We need to scrape the barnacles off the ship. Okay. We need to make the ship run more smoothly, make it more efficient, make it better for businesses. And so we're going to roll out a package of about 15, 16 pieces of legislation. Some are tax bills, some are spending bills, some are just reforms of the rules and the way we do things to make us do things more efficiently. Mm -hmm. to cut out some of the bad legislation. Do they? Do you ever sit down with the Democratic side and at least have a meeting with them and, and let your position be known? Yeah, we, we don't have formal meetings necessarily, yeah. but we talk all the time. One of the things I think people don't necessarily appreciate about the legislature is, despite what you see, some of the back and forth that you yeah. see in the press and on the floor, there's a lot of informality behind the scenes when sessions are out. So we talk constantly, okay. uh, both in session and out. All right, let's take some, some positions here. Uh, the one that's on everybody's mind and could be an, uh, an issue in the next election because we are going to have elections for reps and senators next uh, November and also for governor and other general officers. And one old penny that's been hanging around is the 38 studios, and it's more than just a penny. It's a, about $75 million and might even grow to $100 million. As we all know, it's a moral obligation. Uh, that the state does not owe the money legally, and if they sued, they probably couldn't get a quarter. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the bonds are insured. Many people maintain the fact that it's only a moral obligation. The people of Rhode Island did not vote for it. They didn't want it, if you saw the polls at that time. So why should we pay it? And what would be the consequences if we didn't pay it? What's, some opinion, what's your opinion on that, and what, what stance will you be taking? Well, to be clear, I'm going to take the same stance I took last year. I don't think we should pay it. Okay. And just to also be clear, if I thought the right thing to do was to pay it, even though it's not say, a popular position, I would go back to my district and explain why. Mm -hmm. What happened was last, maybe February, about a year ago, uh, knowing that 38 Studios had just gone down the tubes and this question was going to arise, I went to my staff and I said, listen, we need to get an answer to this question by June because we knew that we were going to have to look at sure. the first payment last year. Please do what you can to research this topic and figure out what happens if we don't pay this. What are the legal ramifications? What are the ramifications on the bond rating and mm -hmm. so, so forth and so on? They came out with as detailed a report as they could. I published it in a letter on June 18th. Mm -hmm. It's about eight pages long, single spaced. Yep. Uh, it's on the web. Um, it outlines the possible repercussions of not paying. And it's not that there's no repercussions, right. but even the worst case scenario they came up with is still better than paying not the 75 whatever yeah, million dollars. I agree. <laughs> and, and I told my Democratic colleagues that the Republicans got behind me and said, we're not going to pay this. We had a big fight last year over 2.5 million. And what kills me is nobody has come out with a counter analysis. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but somebody's got to prove to no, me I'm wrong. No one has, in fact, they even put in the budget a $50,000 line <laughs> item to find someone to give an opinion on it, and no one, no one bid at the $50,000 right. offer. They were scrambling last June to get the votes to pass that budget article. Yeah. They got it by a whisker. And I think part of the reason they got there were several reasons they got it. But one reason was they made the promise that, look, even though we just spent six months doing nothing to study the issue, just <laughs> assuming you all would go along with this, now that we realize we had a revolt on our hands, we'll study it for next year. 
Well, here we are. It's January. Nothing. And, not, and nothing came up. There's no study. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and frankly, that would be an issue, in my opinion, next election. Absolutely. For, it for should in, be an issue for yeah. any rep, yeah. primary or general election. I agree that, that that's going to be something. I can just see the advertisements now. Someone running against an incumbent who said pay the $75 million. Uh, the, the person running against that, 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 that uh, representative can say, hey, I didn't vote for 38 studios. That's $100 million, almost $100 million <laughs> thrown down the wayside. We didn't get a thing for it. Let's move on to, uh, to the other, other things here we can talk about, and that's the Sakonet River tolls, bridge tolls. If, uh, I did a, a commentary here the other day on Channel 6, and I, I was reviewing the year 2013, and I said the funniest story. Uh, was the Scotland Bridge told I me? Mean, it's not funny in the sense that it's just laughable. It just, it just was. It, the, it shows the incompetence of leadership in the state of Rhode Island. Well, we're going to toll the bridge, not toll the bridge, and then put ten cents on it in a political deal, and we still don't know what's <laughs> going to happen. I mean, it's it's hilarious. What what is the what what is the bottom line on that? The bottom line is I, I think I think the tolls are going to go on as scheduled. You know, right now if we don't take any the, action, yeah, yeah. the tolls are going to go up in February. Uh, what happened was again there was a revolt on the budget over right. the tolls last year. They and held the Sakonet people. They held the the, the 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 speaker hostage. They held. Yep, they did. And and but unfortunately, they did not really get anything for holding him hostage. They got a delay. <laughs> a delay. But they didn't get anything substantive. If we, the General Assembly, does not act by I forget the exact date. Yeah. But it's about a month. Uh, the tolls are going to go on anyway. They, that's going to be like four bucks or whatever. It is. Whatever whatever it is they yeah, want to do. They were. Okay. So uh, they they traded their votes last spring, but they for really nothing. didn't. Get, for, well, that's how I looked at it yeah. at the time. Yeah. Now, in addition to that, um, Brian, you you also could say that there's a committee that's been meeting. There's been a couple of committees that have been meeting throughout the, the, the recess of the session, and that, is, and that is the one on infrastructure. Mike Lewis comes on this show every so often. He tells me he knows the bridges that are going to be fixed. He knows the roads that are going to be fixed. He said it's about 400 million bucks. There's 172 bridges that need to be fixed. And so we don't need to do a study as to what needs to be done. He knows what bridges have to be fixed. Yeah. Question is, there's a study commission now of how we're going to fix this infrastructure, and it's a possibility of the Federal Highway Trust Fund not being funded next year. We get 80% of our dollars for roads from the federal government. What's the answer to that question? You know, I just saw that presentation by Michael Lewis yep. at a breakfast meeting about the trust fund. Yep. Um, it's a concern, but something tells me at the end of the day yeah, that'll we'll. be funded. The real issue with the tolls on this kind of bridge is we are now paying for the sins of past legislatures. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you this, is, this is beyond the scope of this show, but if yep. you go back and look at the history of transportation, construction, and bridge yep. funding in the state, it's disgraceful. We have built ourselves up a deficit and we're now trying to, you know, Catch up. fill it in. And, and the toll idea came up as sort of the, the best of a series of bad ideas. <laughs> the problem now is now that it's enacted, now that they got the machinery up there, the only way you can really take that down is if you can convince people from the rest of the state to raise their own constituents' fees in other areas. And it may be the right thing to do, but it's not a politically easy thing to do. No, and so that's got to be solved. And as you say, by February, those tolls are going to go on whether they like it or yeah, not. Yeah, as a practical matter, do you think we're going to do anything in January about the tolls? Uh, my, if I had to be a betting man, I'd say probably not, uh, because I don't think that committee has come up with any solutions as to how to do the infrastructure. Right. And by the way, even if they say... Uh, raise license fees. The license and registration fees, they go to the general fund. They don't go to the Department right. of Transportation. So even if you did that, you'd have to, even if you said, okay, we're going to take that money and put it toward roads, you'd have to find a supplement for it in the, in the regular budget to make up for that money. So yeah. I don't know what's going to happen there. There's another, another problem that, that there's no leadership on. Um, let's go furthermore and let's talk about uh, let's talk about some, some uh, the, the structural, the pension issue. Yeah. That still isn't resolved. It's before Judge uh, Taft Carter. Yeah. Uh, she has uh, asked the two parties to sit down and mediate. That's got to come to a head pretty soon. And my question to you is this, is even if she says, okay, the mediation happened and we, they've come to a terms that I'm going to order that instead of re being retired at, at age 95, you, get, you retire at age 61 or something like that, or, or the COLAs come back in existence. Doesn't the legislature have to pass that because we're statutorily uh, yeah, involved? It, it's a very strange situation, just so the viewers who don't work. Legal. I, mean, I do a lot of mediation because yeah. I do construction litigation, okay. which is perfectly suited for resolving complicated disputes, <laughs> right? right? Mediation is not a binding thing. What you do in mediation is you get the parties to a lawsuit to sit down in a room yep. and negotiate. And oftentimes the pressure of being in a room facing a, a, yep. some kind of deadline forces them to come to terms. Each side gives a little, they reach a deal. 
The problem here is no deal can be reached because no one's there with binding authority because the only binding authority it's comes from us. That's right. And we're not involved. We and, don't even know yeah. what's going on. And, and, and there's no, no law that says you have, to, you have to rub a stamp with the judge says. Exactly. And not just that. But if that thing comes back to the House floor, let's say they reach some kind of deal. Yeah. And let's say the leadership decides, the speaker decides to let it come to a vote. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen in the amendment process? It's going to be all oh, it's changed be, around. There'll be 100 amendments proposed by all different people. I, so I think we're not on the woods with, the, with the pension situation. I just think the mediation is not going to lead anything. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to watch that. And that could add structurally to the deficit because, frankly, the, the structural deficit now is about $100 million or so in that vicinity. Right. And, and the pension system did not produce what other pension systems produce around the country. They, the average pr uh, uh, return was 12.5%. Rhode Island was 11%, and also we paid some $70 million in fees, which is outrageous. And so we have to contribute, I think, $380 million, I think, to the pension exactly system, 370 80 and obviously, if the money had been, if we had earned what other pension systems had earned, we would have earned 12.5%. That was the median around the country. We only earned 11. That was 1.5% off, which on $7.5 billion, Brian, is, is almost $100 a million, dollars, more than money. Well, so, also, if there's a mediation, they come to some agreement, you, can, you know part of that agreement is going to be more favorable to the unions, which yeah. means we're going to have to put more money in if we yeah. were to agree to it anyway. So I just so don't that's, see it that, That's going to be hang out there. Yeah. All right, let's go to, uh, there's been a proposal to reduce the sales tax by the Center for uh, Price Freedom and Prosperity. Well, actually, actually I, I brought that proposal up myself okay. about a year ago when I was talking, right. <laughs> talking right. to your favorite no. newspaper, but yeah. they, they ran with it. I'll give them credit Okay, for so, so you proposed, and others have proposed to reduce the sales tax by, uh, some say reduce it to zero. I mean, we receive $849 million a year in that revenue. We do. How could you possibly make up that kind of revenue? Here's what it comes down to. There's all kinds of studies on this. Do you believe that a reduction or an elimination of sales tax will in the long term lead to expanded economic growth and additional revenues through other, other sources? I would say yes. Some people would say no. Some people would argue it's a wash. But it's a hell of the, a chance to take, isn't it? Well, the bigger problem is that even though I believe it will lead to that, yeah. that's a long-term benefit. Yeah. In the short term, we would need to adjust the budget somehow. I don't have a simple answer to that question, which is why there's been, and, you know, some study commissions are done to bury issues. Some study commissions are done to actually discuss them. A lot of information has come out about this in the past year. Do I s expect to see something happen to the sales tax this year? Mm. No, but, you know, a lot of times in politics, you know this, you get an idea germinating. Yeah. You get it talking, and over time, I think it would be a good idea. Because here's the thing, the sales tax, we're so small. It's so easy to avoid it anyway. Mm -hmm. It's a bad source of revenue for us to rely upon. How do you feel about reducing it down by th to three percent? Now that would be about half, a little less than half the damage. I, I, no, I'd like to see a start. I think if if you reduce it a little bit and you see a boost in economic activity, that's a signal that reducing it works too. And uh, but if you reduce it, you have to make the revenues up other places, and that's right. problematic. That's exactly. All right, time goes by. And we're having fun here, but I want to get back to, to you. I want to talk to you about guns, mental illness. I want to talk to you about. Uh, about uh, the, uh, the whole approach to economic development in the state of Rhode Island and also talk about the governor's race. But right now, we'll take a short break uh, on the record with Buddy Sands. We'll be right back with Brian Newberry, the Republican minority leader in the House of Representatives. Stay tuned. He said he wanted a sofa to watch football. That perfect piece of furniture's on sale. Whatever you at Raymore and Flanagan, get our best financing offer. 0% interest for 48 months. Get ready to save. Sale prices on every style. And the largest selection of mattresses at the guaranteed lowest prices. Sale is going on now. So, who's winning? Two names say it all. Car accident? It's good to know Mike Bataro. The insurance company has a secret. A secret so big, it could save or cost you thousands. But the good news for you, I know it too. The insurance company's own survey says that on average, injured people with a lawyer get three times more money than those without. Three times more. Isn't that good to know? It's good to know. Mike Bataro. Call 866-LAW-9700. Welcome back to On the Record with Buddy Cianci. My guest this morning, Brian Newberry, re state representative from Boroughville and, and uh, uh, I believe, North Smithfield. North Smithfield yeah. uh, he's the Republican leader of the House of Representatives. There are only about six or seven of them up there, but it's a voice. They call and, ourselves Republicans. <laughs> call, yeah, but then there are a whole bunch in that House who call themselves Democrats, Democrats. but they're really Republicans yeah. uh, in many ways. Let's get into some, some other issues. Guns was a big topic this year. In fact, there's a study commission 
There's a study commission that has to be brought back on sales tax, one on infrastructure, and another one on guns. And I found it kind of uh, alarming that mental illness, if someone has a mental illness, uh, it was not reported to the federal government. Um, and uh, so someone could apply to buy a gun uh, and go through the checks nationally and it would not show up if a Rhode Islander had a mental problem or was treated for mental illness or was or had a problem, and it wouldn't show up, and therefore that they, they could go buy a gun, but yet that person might have mental illness. It's a very t tough subject, I know, because yeah. of, of personalities and because of privacy. How do you feel about it? You know, it's ironic because Rhode Island, a lot of Rhode Islanders don't know this. Rhode Island has some of the strictest gun laws in the country as it is. And if you remember the big debate federally last year, it was yep. over background checks. Right. That was national. We have background checks in Rhode Island. Yep. Yeah, as you pointed out, we don't provide mental health information to the federals. Yep. Well. And, and, you know, if you ever look, every time there's some kind of shooting incident, be it at a school or just any kind yeah. of these, these tragedies that happen from time to time. They almost always involve someone with mental illness. That's the real link between these tragedies. Right. Right. I don't have an easy answer to that, but I will say this though. There are constitutional rights to gun ownership. There's constitutional rights to privacy. How do you balance those out? It seems to me that if, if someone truly has mental illness problems, it's documented. I think there's got to be some way to reveal that in the form of a background check. There's and, other disqualifying factors. And, and so you would, you, would be, uh, you would be in favor of notifying the federal government of, of mental commitments or mental illness commitments or mental illness diagnosis. But here's the point. In concept, yes, but yeah. the devil's but in the then, details. The, the devil's the in the details. Yeah. What, what is mental illness and what is not that's mental illness? And exactly. that's the key. So you're yeah. going to be addressing that this year, maybe. Uh, we certainly hope so. Now, we're going to, this coming year, uh, by this time next year, we'll have certainly a new mayor of Providence. We'll have uh, f at least four new general offices because Chafee's not running. The lieutenant governor's term limited. The secretary of state is term limited. Uh, and as is the, uh, the general treasurer, and they're all running for different offices or whatever. But we'll have new general offices, except maybe for attorney general, and that may not be Well, hopefully a we'll have a new dark. attorney general, well, too. Well, you, <laughs> might, you might have, a, a, who's running? A, a Dawson, Dawson Hodgson, yeah. Hodgson, he might run. He's going to run on a couple of issues, uh, I, I imagine, uh, 38 Studios and a few other things. Uh, but we'll have to have him on, too. We'll have Peter Kilmartin on, too. But, but only, the only possibility of having the same person in office is the attorney general. Correct. We'll have a brand new slate next year at this time. Um, the governor's race. Who are you supporting in the governor's race and why? Uh, I support Alan Fung. Uh, I know both Alan Fung and Ken Block well. I like them both well. Uh, if Ken Block wins a primary, I will support him. I think he'll be a good governor. I just think Alan will make a better governor. And mainly for, I would say, uh, personality reasons, I put it, or, or temperament reasons. Alan has worked as a chief executive in the political field. As you know, you were a mayor. He was mm -hmm. a mayor. Um, being a Republican governor, by definition, means having to work with the Democrats. Alan's done that. Yeah. Um, he just has the, I think he has the best temperament of any of the candidates running to be governor. It doesn't mean he's the only qualified or good candidate to be governor, but he's the best candidate to be governor, and that's why I support him. Okay, so you support Alan Fung. How about, uh, does the Republican Party going to have some viable candidates uh, uh, to run for lieutenant governor and and run for uh, attorney general? Yeah, I guess attorney general, you've got yeah. a candidate, but general treasurer, and I've heard I haven't heard any names. Uh, well, you know, I, I don't know her personally, and I don't yeah. want to speak for her, but I've heard Catherine Terry, uh, Catherine Terry Taylor's yeah. name bandied about as She almost candidate. beat Mollis last time. Right, and I've heard... Just a small amount of mo votes she lost. Yep, and I've heard she may run for the lieutenant governor, secretary of state. Uh, that would leave the treasurer. The treasurer spot's the one office I haven't heard anything for. Yeah. But you know, sometimes candidates come out of the woodwork later in the, in the year, too. They'd like to see how the field comes out, and they'll see how it goes. Yeah, the Republican Party, I, I addressed them. I addressed Democrats, Republicans. I went there, and it seemed to be a pretty big split between the Republican Party. I saw them. There were people on one side who were totally different philosophically from the other people. Just there. like the Democratic Party. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess. But, but these people, you know, they, they show up to meetings, and they, they fight for their principles and all, and Democrats kind of cover over it. Um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> they're all one happy family until it comes time to vote. But let's, let, let's get into uh, some other issues. We talked about the governor's race. We talked about the ticket. The Republican Party is weak in this state. There's yes. no question about it. How do you feel the Republican Party can uh, really make a difference? I mean, there's you up there, there's a couple of others, but you, they, don't even, I mean, they don't even have to worry about your votes because you don't make a difference. You might make a difference in a very, very close vote, but those don't often come up. I think what ultimately has to happen in this state is the reason there needs to be more Republicans in the General Assembly is not because we need more, quote unquote, conservatives or fewer liberals or what have you. It's because when you have one party control of such dominance, it lends all power to the leadership. It's a little bit of political science here, but it's yeah. reality. I've seen it. It gives the speaker, whoever the speaker is, right. has almost total control of the chamber. You know why? Because let's say there's a distant group of Democrats yeah. that is upset with the leadership on their side, and they can threaten to break off and work with us. Yeah. There's so many Democrats, the speaker can say, I don't need your votes. Yeah. I've got 50 other people. That's the problem. If you look at the voting records and the philosophies of a lot of the Republican members of the House now and past and present and yeah. Democratic members, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of Democrats sure. in the chamber far more conservative than I am. But 
they need to step up and be who they are. Or voters have to say, you know what, both these candidates are reasonable, this Democrat, that Republican, both reasonable, but we're better off having more of an opposition party in the House or the Senate. That's, that's the reality to it. Uh, the change in name of the Rhode Island uh, Economic Development Corporation, that to me seemed more like plastic surgery. Yeah, it, was, it was like changing a guy's face, uh, but lipstick on a pig, it's still what it is. A change in the name isn't going to change much. What do you think has to be done with that organization in order for it to truly make a difference? Right now, it's toxic. The, the department, I don't care what you call it. Yeah. People don't trust mm -hmm. it. It's 38 Studios. They fired everybody who was over there, uh, who members, and they put new members on. But still, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of credibility. What needs to be done there? Because that's the tool for economic development, the main tool. It is, although, as I said, going back to being the show, being the you know, small government conservative that I really am, yep. I believe the best tool for economic development is to create an environment of you know, less regulatory red tape, lower taxes, just basically streamlining the ability to do business. That's not to say we forego all environmental regulations or anything goes. I'm not saying that. But Rhode Island is a very difficult place to do business. Any business owner will, will tell, tell you that. that. Yeah. And, and EDC, doesn't, whatever it's called, whoever's running it, that doesn't really help. Saying to someone, we're a very difficult place to do business, but we've got this great state agency that will help you navigate our difficult <laughs> regulations, that's not attractive. What's attractive is not having difficult regulations in the first place. That comes from us, and it comes from the departments, the agencies that, that okay. do that. Uh, we saw the this 38 Studios debacle, but then again, we also see this sales tax, piecemeal kind of ways to improve the economy. Don't you think that, um, and I don't know if the Republic is going to do this this year or not, but a comprehensive look at the tax structure, because taxes are, are high. We're, yep. we're the highest in property, one of the highest in property taxes. We're certainly about midway when it comes to income taxes, but we're high in corporate taxes. The estate taxes is disgusting. I mean, it's, uh, it's just, it drives people out of here. So if you took looked at all those taxes, the corporate taxes, the property taxes, regionalization, and really did a, a whole revamp of the, of the mm -hmm. not just take one tax and, and say we're going to lower the sales tax, but look yeah. at it all together and propose a comprehensive program along with regionalization to reduce the cost of government. Don't you think we need that kind of an overhaul? Well, it's funny you bring that up because I said earlier we do have an agenda. Yeah. I don't want to spoil the party by yeah. announcing every single piece of legislation yeah. we have, but part of it is looking at our tax structure. Here's the thing. It's easy to say, and a lot of Republicans are guilty of saying, oh, just cut taxes. It's not that simple. What you need to do is look at the whole tax structure, mm -hmm. and you need to figure out what are the taxes that make it most difficult for either businesses to locate here, expand here, or to keep people here. The estate tax is a killer. It's a killer. And sure. what kills me about the, these, no, no pun intended, about the estate tax is that you'll get people, the progressives, for example, who argue in a class warfare type. Mm -hmm. Well, it's only fair that they pay. They're not paying. They're avoiding it. <laughs> They're avoiding it by taking their money and leaving. Right. You'd have to be crazy to die. If you're wealthy, yeah. you really have to be crazy to die in Rhode Island. Yeah. You can still spend your five, five months and 29 days here yeah. and go somewhere else. And, and you skip out on so much tax. It's unbelievable. Right. So why not get rid of it? It doesn't even bring in that much money. I think the last yeah. day I looked, it brought in yeah. somewhere between 20 and 30 million dollars. Yeah. But those individuals who, who leave are the people who were the philanthropists, the people who donated yeah. to charities, the people who created businesses and, right. and would keep businesses going. And that's one example, but you're right. We need to look, cut. That's, that's an example of a tax that hurts yeah. the state. There's also another group which of progressives that are saying we should increase the income taxes. Well, there we say that. That's Yeah, the but I mean, I, I don't know where that's going, but we're talking about cutting taxes. We have high taxes. We're already the 27th highest, so we're right in the middle just about, so they want to raise it. The other tax uh, that seems to be extremely unfair is the property tax. And what is, it, what is the Republican Party going to do about that? I mean, what's your suggestion you know, on property taxes? You've got to reduce the cost of government or give them more state aid. What, what, what's the answer? Well, you need to do both. One of the things that we are looking at, I, and I, was the details are still in formation, but we're looking at trying to put some kind of proposal. Number one, I'd love to get rid of the car tax again. Yeah. Now, to do that, you need more state money. What, what they tried to do initially by phasing out the car yeah. tax, by giving more state aid, was the right way to do it. You can't just cut the legs out from the uh, yeah. municipalities. But the car tax is a killer. I mean, especially with the yeah. exemptions. In my town, our exemption is the minimum. Yeah. I have a, my car in the parking lot right now is 14 years old with 210,000 miles, and I pay a tax bill of like 140. Why am I paying tax on a 14-year-old <laughs> car? Four more years of being antique, I think, by definition. You, you know? can't afford to buy a new car. The tax will be high. Well, that's the other thing. I want to pay a tax on that. That's it's why crazy. in Providence, a lot of people don't, uh, you know, they, they, a lot of people don't want to pay those taxes. Oh, yeah. They don't buy brand new cars. They buy older cars. Yeah, and that kills the economy, too. Sure it does. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, your future. Um, you seem to know what you're talking about. You're a popular young man. 
uh, would you ever consider running for state office? Uh, you know, it's it's flattering to be asked the question, mm -hmm. and there's so few Republicans, it's not surprising. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, as you know, my son is actually here uh, yeah. as we're taping this. He's in uh, fourth grade, and uh, he, I will be able not. To hand out literature for yeah, him, I have no plan to run for any office other than my current office okay. uh, until he's at least uh, grown up. All right. After so. that, never say never. But that's so far off. You know, that's a lifetime. I can't make any predictions. All right. on that. So, so the, the, the uh, Brian Newberry candidacy for governor or uh, not anytime for, soon. Uh, anyway. not anytime I'd soon. much rather become the first Republican speaker in 80 years or whatever it's been. <laughs> so. Well, you know, the uh, the shot of that uh, may not be, you know, it's amazing that the Speaker of the House gets elected. He's the most powerful person yeah. in the state, I would say. And uh, he gets elected by, I don't know, 15, 1,600 people, Well, it depends on what district you're in. My yeah. district gets elected by 4,000 people. Yeah, okay, but his district, <laughs> but yeah, the, the primary, because he's know, not even Republican. I know, that's why, that's why I'm saying Yeah, it. so in the general in the, in the general election, there's not even a Republican that runs over there, most likely. But he wins by about maybe 2,000 votes. And yet he becomes the most powerful person in the state of Rhode Island. Because the other members of the House cede too much power to him. That goes back to what I said earlier about too much of an imbalance. You know, and that, that really is wrong as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let's talk about uh, the fact that we might lose, uh, I noticed in the, in the latest reports, that we, uh, we, we gained 1,204 people in the state. But who yeah. left? Probably the rich ones we were talking about yeah. and some others who were uh, more challenged moved in. And therefore, the net gain might look like we got 1,200 more people, but it probably cost us more. Well, it also lags the national gain, too. It, na so it lags really the not, national gain. Yeah. So, so we are in very close, very, very close to losing a, a congressman. Yeah, we are uh, the smallest state that still has two. Yeah. So the writing was on the wall at the last re yeah. uh, census. So uh, if, if we're going to act on, if this is our last chance, I would think, to, to restructure the pension system to, to make it more realistic to uh, restructure the taxes to make it more compatible with business and to keep people here in the state of Rhode Island as opposed to just having a bunch of legislators go up there and, and, uh, and pass. Uh, uh, you have to be much better than the, than the United States representatives though in, 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 in Senate because they passed, I think, 64 bills and half of them went to name post offices, you know? Yeah, well, I don't uh, know. Numbers of legislation doesn't yeah. necessarily mean quality. Yeah. But yeah, I agree with you on that point. You know, all right. So. Uh, so that we can look forward. When are you going to roll this package out of, uh, of uh, Republican? It's going to start about two weeks. Where our plan at the moment yeah. is to release about two bills a week over the course of maybe six weeks. Why don't you weeks. just give a whole pr presentation uh, of the whole thing? I'll tell you why. So we tried doing that before. We get great coverage for two days, and then we all get ignored for the okay. rest of the session. Just great coverage for two days. So, But you, you should have a structure so that people understand where you're, where you're headed oh, we, instead we of making a, a guessing game. Yeah, no, we, oh, it keeps you interested, though. Yeah, it does keep us interested. Yeah. All right, my guest this morning was Brian Newberry, the Republican leader of the House of Representatives. They go in session on Tuesday, and I'm sure they'll be very lively there, and they'll keep us very busy on talk radio and here at Channel 6 following their... their uh, activities. Okay, stay tuned for uh, more great programming on Channel 6, your ABC affiliate for Southeastern New England. Thanks for being with us and good morning. Tired of overpaying for service on your late model vehicle? Joe & Sons ASE certified technicians now work with the latest diagnostic technology available, giving us the capability to mimic your dealer service. We fix it right the first time. We guarantee it. Looking for the best brands at the best prices? Raymore and Flanagan has it all. Sale prices on Bernhardt, Broyhill, Kathy Ireland's family-friendly designs, leather from the Tootsie Editions, and Cindy Crawford's home collection. Plus, get our best financing offer. 0% interest for 48 months. No money down. Delivery in three days or less. Guaranteed. The best brands, the best prices. There's only one Raymore and Flanagan. Car accident? It's good to know Mike Bataro. A serious accident creates a lot of right now problems. You're worried about your car, seeing a doctor, and whether you'll get stuck paying for it all. The one thing you don't need to worry about is how to pay for a lawyer. Call the Bataro Law Firm. With our no fee guarantee, you don't pay us anything until we get you money. It's good to know Mike Bataro. Call 866 Law 9700 and get the no fee guarantee. Have potholes ruined your vehicle's alignment? Joe & Sons ASE certified technicians now work with the latest Hunter Hawkeye alignment rack that uses the latest in camera software technology. We fix it right the first time. We guarantee it. Alexandra Cowley, Mark Curtis, ABC 6 News, weeknights at 5. My name is Nick Kelling and I'm 16 years old and a junior at Bishop Hendrickon. When I was born, my mom was told that I would only live a year because of the many congenital heart defects I had. After suffering a cardiac arrest as an infant and heart block, I am a survivor. Congenital heart defects are the number one cause of death in children under one. Support the American Heart Association. 
Join the fight to help save the lives of kids like me. Visit heart.org slash At ABC6, being your source for local news is not something we take lightly. That's why we're always striving to bring you more. From more places in southern New England. You don't have to be outside very long to realize just how dangerous these temperatures are. Devoting more resources so that you get more of the story. Earlier tonight, you can see there were these massive yellow tubes blasting heat into those condos that are still just saturated with the water. ABC6, your town, your life, your... Killer cold, frigid sub-zero temperatures, it's dangerous weather we haven't seen in decades. And there's a huge new snowstorm on the way. Shivering in the stands, today's playoff game in Green Bay may be the coldest NFL game ever. Could it break the record set at the infamous 1967 Ice Bowl? Caught on camera, an entire neighborhood on alert because of a mountain lion on the prowl. And now this beast is making meals out of neighborhood pets. And star treatment. One of the hottest pop singers on the planet, Kesha, entering rehab. What she's telling fans this morning about why she needs help. From ABC News, this is Good Morning America, Sunday, January 5th, 2014. From New York, Dan Harris and Bianca Goladriga. Hey, good morning, everybody. We are, believe it or not, heading into a 24-hour period in which parts of America will see wind chills near 60 below. We've got a live shot of Green Bay's Lambeau Field where cheese heads will be armed with hand warmers and hot cocoa today as well as other varieties of antifreeze. <laughs> Rod Claiborne yeah, no might doubt. want to fill us in on that later. And uh, check this out. This is a fountain in Atlanta, Georgia, frozen solid. Our extreme team is out in full force covering this story, including the forecast for you coming up this morning. One person not out in full force is Ron Claiborne, though. A lot of people <laughs> were worried about him Welcome yesterday. Back. I'm okay. Fantastic. I, You're okay. I survived. You yeah, made America it. can relax. Welcome yeah. back. We we'll missed you. <laughs> also, you. Also ahead on the show, what promises to be one of the more bizarre birthdays ever, yeah. how North Korea's young dictator Kim Jong-un plans to celebrate this week with his friend, former NBA star Dennis Rodman, the special gift Rodman has put together for his pal and what implications that could have on our relationship with the rogue nation. Yeah, we'll get to that story coming up, but we're gonna start with the extreme weather. Dangerous, in fact, life-threatening cold, followed by yet another massive winter storm. ABC's Gio Benitez is in Chicago, where they could get another foot of snow. Gio, good morning. Good morning to you, Dan. Yeah, the snow has been hammering us all night long. Now so is the wind. And take a look. You see that field of snow and ice behind me? Well, that's actually the harbor. That's Lake Michigan, completely frozen over. This is what's happening all across the Midwest. After days of dealing with intense snow and freezing temperatures, the Midwest is about to get right back on the winter roller coaster, with temps from Iowa to Ohio dropping fast. My hair froze this morning, so... So that was shocking. An additional 8 to 10 inches of snow expected to fall in Chicago tonight. Then the below freezing temps set in right in time for the beginning of the work week. Officials are warning exhausted travelers who have been camping out at airports this weekend to be cautious. This Spirit Airlines plane heading for Vegas skidded off a runway at O'Hare last night, giving 145 unhurt passengers a terrifying start to their weekend. Oh, we tried to get out yesterday, and our flight got canceled. Icy highways packed with red brake lights and littered with overturned cars and trucks. In this wicked winter weather, travel's not the only thing that's dangerous. It's so cold that this cup of boiling water instantly freezes in midair. Experts stressing that more than dangerous, that frigid air can be deadly. Minnesotans, we're accustomed to cold weather, but when you talk about temperatures that are 50 to 60 below, I, I don't think most people fully appreciate the fact that just five minutes of exposed skin at those types of temperatures can have a pretty serious impact. So the most important thing right now, keep those ears covered, keep those fingers and toes covered, because the biggest concern here in weather like this Frostbite, Biana. That's right. It can happen in just minutes. GOR, thanks to you and stay warm. 
So how cold will it get and where will the next big new snowstorm hit? Well, we want to welcome back meteorologist Brad Nitz from our Atlanta affiliate WSB Channel 2 Action News. He's been tracking it all. A very busy weekend for you, Brad. Absolutely. The very cold air we've been forecasting is now moving in across parts of the nation. Look at these wind chill readings this morning. We're looking at 52 below in Duluth. 40s below around Fargo, and then that cold air will continue to dive to the south and east. So wind chill readings tomorrow morning, 61 below in Bismarck and Fargo, 48 below wind chill in Chicago. That means exposed skin freezes in about five minutes. Very dangerous weather conditions there. The cold not confined just to the north, over two dozen states under uh, these warnings and advisories for dangerous wind chills extends all the way down into the deep south and this arctic blast reaches the gulf coast look at the forecast temperatures in the deep south in birmingham 36 this morning single digits by tuesday morning same story in atlanta and even 20s as far south as new orleans and tallahassee now we'll be looking ahead towards the wind chills reaching the northeast in that sub 15 range in new york by tomorrow more on that and expected snow accumulation coming up. All right, I'm thinking about taking the week off and staying home. <laughs> Brad, thank you. As we mentioned, the playoff game in Green Bay today could be. Could Five minutes at negative 50. That's all it takes to get frost right. So you can see the problem and the concern and why it's a life-threatening situation. When you see temperatures like this currently, these are current temperatures, negative 53 right now. That's what it feels like in Duluth. Chicago, negative 41. Indianapolis, negative 38. This is the key. Everyone's saying it's not just the cold air. That's not the reason it's illegal to drive. It's because they saw a foot of snow just yesterday. There's also winds out there. Of course, wind chill comes from winds. So 40 mile per hour winds blowing around a foot of snow out there. That's making visibility less than half a mile for that reason. Of course, they don't want people trapped in the snow with those life-threatening temperatures. It's the combination there that's really the concern. How long is this expected to last? I mean, take a look. You're starting to see some relief, but not really. Temperatures are 40 degrees below average, even for places like Minnesota. This is not typical for them, and nor is it typical, especially when you go down to the southeast. These temperatures, again, still 30 degrees below normal once you talk about Atlanta today, where they actually had sleet in the morning. So definitely very dangerous out there. What are we talking about? Well, there is a change in the northeast. One of the only places other than the west where they had mild conditions this morning. I mean, current temperatures were in the 40s and 50s, but notice that warm front is kicking out of here, and here comes that cold Arctic air. So yes, those temperatures will actually be cooling off as we go throughout the day at freezing by about 5 p.m. or so. So the danger will move into the northeast as well, where by tomorrow it should be about 60 degrees cooler than it <sighs> was today. Notice those wind chills. Good 30 below expected tomorrow. It looks like in Pittsburgh, negative 27 degrees. Very dangerous. I'm just saying by Wednesday, you said it's going to be 41 degrees in Atlanta, that'll feel balmy. You're excited now, right? I am Respected. excited. Thanks, Indra. <laughs> I appreciate it. Checking other top stories this morning at 29 minutes past the hour, the wreckage of a flip charred plane seen at the Aspen, Colorado airport. The small plane uh, burst into flames upon landing Sunday, killing the co-pilot and injuring two others on board. The pilot had missed his first approach to the airport due to high winds. The Senate is expected to confirm Janet Yellen to be the next chair of the Federal Reserve. The vote is later today. Yellen would replace Ben Bernanke, whose term ends this month. She'd be the first woman to head the Federal Reserve in its 100-year history. A pro-Hillary Clinton super PAC has rented out the email list of Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. As first reported by Time Magazine, the Ready for Hillary group wanted to connect with past supporters. And the plan seems to have worked. The group tweeted that it made the biggest one day online fundraising hall Sunday. Clinton has not yet said whether she will even run for the White House. A political shocker this morning and first on CNN, Liz Cheney, Dick's daughter, is dropping her bid for the U.S. Senate. In a statement, Cheney says, quote, serious health issues have recently arisen in our family and under the circumstances i have decided to discontinue my campaign now it's unclear what those health issues are but we do know cheney's campaign was not going well she alienated wyoming voters over residency issues and alienated her own sister when she came out against same-sex marriage liz's sister mary is gay and married CNN's national political reporter Peter Hanby broke that story. Also with me, Rouse Douthat, a political commentator for CNN. And